Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm going to start off my talk by saying I'm Leah Milheiser. I'm a gynecologist. I'm a sexual medicine practitioner, and I am a online diagnoser. Who here, by show of hands, is an online diagnoser? Who gets on the internet in the middle of the night to try and figure out what they have? I am officially the worst. I'm going to give you a little bit of a story about myself and how I ended up in this area of social media. I'd also like to say that I'm humbled to be on this panel. I am new to this field, so I'm excited to learn from my fellow panelists today and from the audience as well. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. I'm a hypochondriac. I became a doctor because I wanted to figure out why I was a hypochondriac. It's gotten better over the years. I went to medical school. Medical school is actually not a good place if you're a hypochondriac because all of a sudden you have every single illness that you read about. But I will tell you that when I was pregnant with my first child, remember I'm an OB/GYN. I have patients who come to me and they say I had not had any kids at this point. They would come to me and say, "Dr. Milheiser, I have these symptoms. Is this normal?" Sure, sure, that's normal. You definitely should be feeling that. I had no idea. I read about it. What they're describing sounds like what I read about, but I didn't know. Then I got pregnant with my first kid. I'm an OB. I should know how to take care of myself. I had these symptoms that I said, "What in the world is going on here?" So what did I do? At three o'clock in the morning, I got online, and I started reading threads. I would read patient threads, and I'd say, "I have that." Yes, those are my symptoms, and I started reading about what the patients were describing, and patients were trying to help each other out. And the more I read, the more, for lack of a better phrase, freaked out I became, because a lot of what I read was actually inaccurate, and some of it was downright dangerous. Some of it was great, very supportive, very accurate, but a lot of it wasn't. So this started to lead me down this path of who's getting online to diagnose themselves. Are they actually going to their clinicians and finding out if the diagnosis they're coming up with is accurate? And so I started this blog recently. I'm new to social media within the last year, and what the whole purpose of my blog is is to provide patients with evidence-based data. It's okay to be an online diagnoser. I'm one of them, like I said, but at least I wanted to educate patients that there's places you can do it that have evidence-based information. Now, living in Palo Alto area, working in the Palo Alto area, and having a lot of patients who come from Berkeley and Santa Cruz and San Francisco, what I've learned is that women like to go the natural route. Who's a natural person? Who likes organic? Who likes natural? Raise your hands. We all do. I have two little boys, and I love anything that says organic. I am an organic junkie. Whole Foods, or like we like to say, Whole Paycheck. That's basically where my paycheck goes every month. Okay. So I'm going to start my talk off with this phrase: "Natural is better. Natural is better." Is natural truly better? Not necessarily. There's lots of things that we find in nature that are not good for you. There are a lot of things that we consider unnatural that are good for you. My patients come to me. I've been in practice now for nine years, out of residency. And they come to me and they say, "Dr. Milheiser, I found this product online." Now, for example, douching in my world of gynecology is bad. We teach patients not to do that because it can change the flora of the vagina. It can make you more prone to infection. It can make you more prone to sexually transmitted infections. So we tell people not to do it. So I have patients who come in and say, "Listen, I'm not douching, but what I am doing." Is taking apple cider and tea tree oil, and I'm using that because it's natural. And I say, well, where does it tell you it's natural? Where, where's where do you get the information that that's safe? Where do you get the information that's effective? Well, I looked online, and so it's a natural website, and here it is. And they bring me the information. They bring me the the printout that they have, and basically. It's not based on any data. It's not based on science, and this is just someone who's writing this website who has an interest in natural treatments. Another example is a patient who comes. I also practice menopausal medicine, and in 2001, a study came out and said everybody go off their hormones. Hormones are bad, and so women started going the natural route. Now, what's scary for me, because in my sexual medicine practice, I'd say about 75% of my patients are breast cancer survivors. And so, a lot of these breast cancer survivors—not a lot, but let's say 
a, a good number, will come in and say, I have menopausal symptoms, I can't take hormones, I don't want to take these other antidepressants that are going to treat my symptoms. So I'm going the natural route. I'm taking red clover. Has anybody heard of red clover for treatment of menopausal symptoms? Red clover actually has estrogenic activity. So for those patients who have breast cancer, especially those that are estrogen receptor positive, that can be very dangerous. That can potentially cause a recurrence. There's no good data on that. But if you're thinking about the fact that this has estrogenic properties, it's something to consider. The last one that I want to spend a little bit of time on is the compounded bioidentical hormone therapy. And I'm getting to why I got in. This, all these stories bring us to why I got into this area and what I've learned. So compounded bioidentical hormone therapy. It's on Oprah. It's on, or used to be on Oprah. It's on Dr. Oz. We've got celebrities who are talking about it. Has anybody heard of this, the compounded bioidentical hormones? If anyone saw a movie, and I just happened to see this, someone told me that I should see this for this particular reason. There was a scene from Sex and the City Part 2 where Samantha, everybody knows who Samantha is, had her bioidentical compounded hormones taken away from her at the airport in Dubai, and she needed her hormones. So she started slathering hummus all over her because it was similar to the yams and the soy and everything that she had in her bioidentical compounded hormones. So the reason I bring this up is that I decided on my own to do my own little study online. And these are some things that I picked up on the internet. On very popular websites with celebrities and their doctors, their experts. These experts, now when I'm talking about compounded bioidentical hormone therapy, these are hormones that are bioidentical, so they're chemically similar to what we have in our body. They're made in a compounding pharmacy, which is not FDA regulated. Some of you may have heard about compounding pharmacies recently where there was an outbreak of fungal meningitis and people had actually died because there was uh, some contamination in the steroids that were being used. So what I heard on these websites with celebrities and with their experts, their physicians, was that Compounded bioidentical hormones are natural because they're made from soy and yam. But the stuff that the FDA gives you is unnatural because it's synthetic. Well, as far as I know, any compounded hormone therapy is synthetic. It's made in a lab just the way our FDA-regulated hormone is. This was a really scary one for me. Bioidentical hormones are different than what you can get the FDA-approved versions because they won't increase your risk of breast cancer. Someone show me the data. There's no data. There is no data that supports that. The survival rate of women with breast cancer is better if they take compounded bioidentical hormones. Again, no data. Last one is, and this one I found very interesting, bioidentical compounded hormones will decrease every cause of death in women. That's a pretty bold statement to make. Now, I will tell you that this particular celebrity has published a lot of books. I have patients bringing me this book all the time, saying, this is what I want to look like, this is what I want, here's what the experts in this book say, and this is what I'd like you to put me on. Well, if you go and you listen to it, the American College of OBGYN and the North American Menopause Society and the Endocrine Society basically says is, what I agree with, there's no evidence supporting the superiority claims of these types of hormones. There's these hormones are lacking uh, studies in efficacy and safety. These pharmacies are not regulated by the FDA. And a last part of this is, in these books, and when you hear people talking about them online and on TV, you're supposed to measure salivary levels of hormones because your salivary levels are going to give you a true picture of your hormone level. There's absolutely no data to support that, and there's actually data refuting that. So when I have patients come to me and say, but Dr. Milheiser, I understand that the FDA has bioidentical hormones. We have FDA-approved bioidentical hormones. They are different than the types that are compounded in a pharmacy. You don't know what that compounding pharmacy is giving you. You don't know how high the dose is, how low the dose is, how pure it is. So we tell people, you know, I understand that you're seeing this online. I understand that you're an educated consumer but I ask you to look at the evidence. I ask you to look at who's writing this. I ask you to look at who's supporting these theories before we make a decision to start you on, a, on any medication or before you make a decision to go on them on your own. So this made me interested in 
what is out there on the internet? Has anyone actually done a study looking at the accuracy of information on the internet, medical information? And this is actually a, an interesting study that was done and published in the Journal of Pediatrics. And it was called Safe Infant Sleep Recommendations on the Internet. Let's Google it. So having your infant sleep in the correct position is extremely important to avoid SIDS, correct? So this group looked at 1,300 websites. And what they found was that about 48%, almost half, gave accurate information. 28% gave inaccurate information. I think that's pretty alarming. And then 28% gave information that wasn't really relevant. So I think that sort of brings home the point. Now, this next study, I'm very honored to have the author of this study in the audience and to speak with her last night about her study, which I think is incredible data. So many of you have already seen this. 59% of Americans will go online for health information. 80% of them, more or less, will start at Google or some other search engine. They're not necessarily going to the CDC. They're not necessarily going to Mayo Clinic, um, to Stanford websites, to the NIH. They're going to Google. I go to Google. I have gone to Google and said, you know, these are my symptoms because it's easy. And then it takes you to all these different websites, and you can pick and choose what you want to look at. So this is interesting, and it applies to my practice, which is that 35% of adults are online diagnosers. We had about 35 to 50% of the people in this room raise their hand when I asked that question. Women tend to do it more often than men. Now, the question becomes, how many of these people will actually go to their clinician and actually get that diagnosis confirmed. So about 41% did that. So there's 60% of those people out there who diagnose themselves who don't have confirmation of their diagnosis. The next two uh, statistics I have are also very interesting. 72% of people believe that everything they read on the internet is pretty accurate. And then 75% don't always check the source of this information. This is what I always try to teach my patients. Know who's writing, who's the author of the website, who's giving the information, and find out if that website is being supported by any companies. Very important information. So when I decided to embark into the world of social media, which is a very daunting place, and which, by the way, was recommended to me to do four years ago, I was at a luncheon with some of the business leaders, female business leaders in Silicon Valley, and one of the women turned to me during the luncheon and said, why aren't you blogging? And I looked at her and I said, what in the world is blogging? And she, and she said, if you want to make a name for yourself in medicine, if you really want to make a difference for women in their care, the future of medicine is social media. And she could not have been more, more correct. What I found with social media, promote healthy habits and lifestyles. That's a big part of what I do on my blog. We can teach people to prevent chronic illnesses. We're changing the way people are talking about their health. We have, so for my field, if you look at the data in sexual medicine in terms of patient report of a problem, 14% of patients will spontaneously tell you they have a sexual issue. When a doctor asks, that goes up to about 55%. A lot of people are embarrassed to come in and talk about sexuality and sexual function. This is a way that I can get to those in my blog, get to those people who don't necessarily want to come in and talk about their sexual problem. It's also a great place to give advice about treatments, about dietary issues, anything about illness you can talk about on a blog, as long as that blog, in my opinion, is based on the facts, is based on evidence. So what are the advantages of health education on the internet? Discreetly obtained information, you can seek useful information from a wide range of sources, low cost or free for the most part, but this is the most important one. Provide information for those people who may not be able to seek care. So that's really what I feel social media can do. You can provide information to those people who don't have access to medical care. What are the disadvantages? Obviously, inaccurate information, it's not evidence-based, false identities. Anybody can claim to be an expert. Anyone can claim to be somebody that they're not. And also, 
you know, there's a lot of people in this room. We have the e-patients. We have educated, empowered patients who know how to navigate the internet. They know what to look for. They know what's valid, what's not, what's accurate, what's not. The majority of my patients that I see in my practice, they don't. They don't know how to evaluate the accuracy of a website. So that's what we're, again, what we're trying to do through social media and what I'm trying to do through my blog is to educate people on what you need to look for in a website to show you that that's accurate, to show you that that's safe information. So many of you have seen these JAMA benchmarks. Again, a way to assess the accuracy of a site that you may go to. So know who the authorship, I've said that a lot. Know where that information is coming from. Disclosures, very important. Who runs the website? Who has ownership of the website? Who's supporting the website? And lastly, how often is that website updated? I recently went to a site about some sexual medicine topics. The site was written about six or seven years ago. None of the data was current, but it was still up there and looked like it was. So this is just a snapshot of my web page. Um, you can see it's got some funny pictures on there. The one with the tongue I get asked a lot about, but the topic was, what your tongue can tell you about your health. So these are different things that we can do. We can provide patients with evidence-based data to take control of their life, their health, their knowledge. We can use our websites and our blogs to empower patients. We can address issues that patients may be a little bit uncomfortable approaching their physician about. And what I think websites do and blogs do is they open the door for further conversation. Thank you very much. I look forward to your feedback.